Norse paganism is something we don't know very much about at all. Precious little sources survive on the subject, and it is the matter of much debate. Understanding the beliefs, practices, and mindsets of a people so distant and different to us from a modern standpoint presents significant difficulties and issues to avoid. Even the very words we use to categorize Norse paganism are the subject of much debate, with the concept of religion seeing some criticism within the scholarship as of late. As such, this is a discussion of this criticism in light of a new understanding, that is, Norse paganism as a way of life. Before I can start with this discussion, I must address that there are multiple words referring to Norse paganism. To keep things simple, I'll refer to it as paganism, though there are convincing arguments in the field for the usage of the tad wordier Norse polytheism. Why is categorizing Norse paganism as a religion so debated? Many scholars argue that religion is a fundamentally modern concept, and as such, carries many preconceptions that distort our view of history. This modern conception of religion understands it as an organized entity with holy texts, ordained priests, fundamental dogmas, moralities, and approved places of worship. Even if we remove the clearly organized parts from this idea of religion, elements of this understanding remain which are distinctly modern. That is, the concept of singular truth, a distinction between the natural and supernatural, and the idea of personal belief. Essentially, the legacy of Abrahamic religions, that is, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, these concepts lie implicitly within religion whenever we use it to describe something. Each of these concepts are inadequate to describe the practices of the pagans of old, leading to large misconceptions about a distant past. For instance, when we think of religion, the idea of truth is typically implied. That is, one follows religion because it is the truth, and the deities involved are the true ones. Such is the concept of singular truth, where the religion that one adheres to clearly lays out their god or gods as being the only ones worthy of worship. To engage with others from other religions goes against the teachings and tenets of the true religion which you have chosen to follow, and in doing so, stops you from being a follower of that religion. Christianity or Islam, for example, hold that to worship or believe in any other idols or gods is an act which contradicts the will of the divine and is tantamount to heresy. To do so makes one no longer Christian or Muslim and leads to both social and supernatural consequences. Furthermore, this concept of a singular truth affects not only the gods you worship, but also the morals and worldview you adhere to. That is, in adhering to the true god or gods, you are also adhering to the truths so associated or supported with these gods. Therefore, to be a true believer, you have to conform to the moral codes as laid out by the deities you worship. This is especially true for organized religions of the written word, such as Christianity, where the morals are supposedly clearly defined in a central text. Indeed, 
Much blood has been spilled over the supposed true interpretation of the truth imparted by texts such as the Bible. While this view may be seemingly limited to the Abrahamic religions, it has influenced the modern conception of religion. To the modern secular Western mindset, this has imprinted an understanding of religion as a choice, whereby the very choice to worship or believe in some gods must come at the exclusion or denial of the rest. Such a choice also dictates the morals you have to live by, as in choosing a religion, you are also choosing a moral code and worldview to live by. Religion, according to this view, is always a clearly laid out system with specific gods, ideals, texts, and places of worship which are neatly wrapped up as being the right or true way to follow it. Those arguing against the description of paganism as a religion stress that this is far from the reality lived by the old Norse polytheists or pagans. Firstly, as an undogmatic polytheistic religion, it did not prescribe who or what were to be the objects of worship. There was no central authority or text that dictated what was to be worshipped and the means to do it by. As such, the worship of some gods did not necessarily come at the exclusion of others. A good example of this would be the integration of the Christian one God into the pantheon of gods worshipped by the Norse. There is much evidence for this, as attributed in the written and archaeological record. For instance, the medieval Icelandic word Landnormabok features a certain story about Helgi in Magri, who settled in Iceland in about 900 and believed in Christ, but invoked Thor when in distress at sea. He also asked Thor to show him where to build his new farm, but he named it after Christ. This is a clear example of how the invocation of several gods from seemingly different systems with their own codes or truths as they would appear to the modern conception of religion did not seem odd to the Norse. Rather, they saw it as part of the natural way one interacted with their gods. That is, beings whom they worshipped for their aid and favour. We also have a few examples within archaeology that combine Christian and pagan imagery, also seemingly without issue. A notable example exists within the diaspora, which is the Gosforth Cross in Cumbria. This features both Christian and pagan iconography, with a depiction of the crucifixion, Thor's fishing trip, and Vivar's battle with Fenrir. The over Hogdal tapestries of Sweden, dating from the late Viking Age, also feature a mixture of symbology from the gods of old and Christianity. Indeed, early conversion narratives in seeking to appeal to the Norsemen portrayed Christ as a figure of power, and it is no surprise, therefore, that many included him in the group of other powerful beings to whom they paid respect. In terms of examples of this open attitude to worship outside the conversion era, there are arguments that some of the gods, such as Skavi, are of Sami origin. Furthermore, Scholars, such as Price, have argued convincingly in favour for the potential overlap between the practices of Seether and the shamanism of the Sami during the early medieval period. These adoptions of deities and practices from seemingly wholly different systems arose also 
as a result of the fact that Norse paganism existed on a community to community basis. That is, due to its lack of central authority or texts, the practices associated with the worship of the gods changed according to where you were and who you were with. For example, there is no reason to assume that the gods worshipped in, say, Jutland, Denmark, were the same as the gods worshipped in Upland, Sweden. Indeed, according to a survey of the place names in Scandinavia by Stefan Brink, we can point to significant differences in the gods worshipped from area to area. Freyr, for instance, the god of fertility and harvests, appears in a significant number of place names in Sweden and is the most featured amongst them, implying a very important role. In Denmark, however, this is not the case at all, with the place names pointing towards him being a minor figure who paled in comparison to the likes of Toyr and Orvin. A multitude of reasons could factor into the varying practices of each community, and there is evidence of quite functional relationships between the various communities and their gods. Ullin, for example, who is cited passingly in the Icelandic texts as being the god of archery, skiing and hunting, is present in a notable number of place names in Norway and Sweden, where the landscape is such that invoking him has many practical effects. Denmark, on the other hand, does not have a single place name featuring him, which makes sense given the Danish landscape. Worshipping Ullin would have little practical purpose. We have no way of knowing whether one god was worshipped in name by two different communities, was actually thought of or conceived of in the same way. Even the descriptions of the gods from the mythology preserved in the Eddas, which themselves are the site of much debate, are multifaceted and possessed a multitude of associations that may even seem contradictory at first glance. For example, Odin performs multiple roles within the mythology as attested to, with him being a god of the dead, a god of kings and the aristocracy, a god of warbands and warriors, and a god of sorcery and wisdom. While he may have been indeed conceptualized as all of these elements within Viking Age Scandinavia, this seemingly confusing array of roles may have been indicative of a plurality of mythic memory associated with the name Orthin. That is, the myths preserved by the Christian Icelanders such as Snorri may have combined a variety of memories about the character of Orthin into one very complex, multi-dimensional deity. This may imply that to different communities, Orthin was understood and worshipped in different ways, with a chieftain worshipping him as a god of the aristocracy and the warband, whereas a seeress in another community would conceive him as a god of sorcery instead. The beliefs of the Norsemen varied enormously based on location and time period, with the experiences of those partaking in it being potentially unrecognizable from one another. Certainly, there were commonalities, with certain gods such as Odin and Thor seeing popularity in all parts of Scandinavia, as well as the rite of sacrifice being apparently a constant. However, even in these commonalities, these gods and the sacrifices to them would have varied in meaning and practice. 
As such, we are faced with a complex patchwork of heterogeneous belief, which defies our gut instinct categorization as a religion. As explored through the concept of singular truth, our modern conception of religion may be more than a distortion of the past, if we are to apply it as a label to Norse paganism. Indeed, the concept of true religion, in which one had to follow distinct practices and deities to be a true follower, might have been completely and utterly alien to the Norsemen of old. Indeed, to many of the Norsemen, the gods and their worship simply were. No discussion of the truth came into the matter. Such a matter-of-fact approach to worship is a feature of a worldview that saw supernatural elements as gods, alfar, or whites as being natural. That is, beings who were just fundamental to the world as the trees, rocks, or seas were. In light of such a conception of the world and the supernatural, the unsuitable nature of religion as a descriptive term rears its head once more. Indeed, most modern world religions have clear distinctions between what is worldly and otherworldly, with Christianity being a firm example of this. As such, religion as a term will naturally imply this split between what is natural and the supernatural, and due to this, has the potential to distort our understanding of the past. As such, there are quite strong arguments that rail against the categorization of the beliefs and practices of the Norse pagans as a religion. Such a term holds significant baggage in the modern Western mindset, which brings many preconceptions and misunderstandings when approaching a complex historical reality. As such, categorizing Norse paganism as a way of life is proposed as an alternative by the critics of religion. Indeed, this understanding is much closer to how the Norsemen themselves refer to their beliefs. The closest word in Old Norse, as attested by the 13th century Old Norse manuscripts, is seether, meaning custom, habit, or way of life. This was used by the 13th century Christian authors to refer to both Christianity and paganism, with the latter being specified as forn seether, or old habits. As such, it can be argued that even after the conversion, this matter-of-fact approach to worship and the church was not one of truth or faith, but an observance of cultural norms and rituals. That is, the old attitudes towards worship and cultic life endured even after the arrival of Christianity, with its new dogmatic and truth-based forms of worship and sacrality. This would go some way as to reinforcing the prior argument surrounding that of the overlap seen during the conversion period itself. That being said, the limitations of Old Norse as a language cannot necessarily be used to argue for a specific understanding of worship. Indeed, the description of Christianity or paganism as a habit or custom may simply be because the language had no better term, and this is what the medieval writers had to default to when attempting to communicate a concept that we may recognize as religion. Old Norse at this point was a language very much in its literary infancy, that is, it had not been written down in any meaningful quantities before. As such, it had not accustomed itself from an oral language to a literary genre, and therefore did not have the apparatus for the discussion of the abstract concept heralded by Christianity. Latin, on the other hand, saw considerable philosophical discussions about the nature of belief and faith in regards to Christianity during the 13th century as well, with Thomas Aquinas being an example of this. Furthermore, this discussion of the nature of worship, cultic practice, or belief was not the focus of the Old Norse manuscripts. Rather, 
they tended to be focused on matters concerning law, grammar, and poetics. Snorri Sturluson's Prose Edda, for instance, was designed to be a handbook for poets, so they could get accustomed to the old tales on which many poems and poetic constructions such as Kenning's were reliant on. The principal written sources that may illuminate the nature of Norse paganism or attitudes to worship in the period were not concerned with addressing these at all, and rather made passive reference to them. Therefore, we cannot be sure if the usage of Seether to describe paganism or Christianity was even illustrative of the contemporary attitudes amongst the Norsemen. A way of life categorization based on this may be just as much in a misinterpretation of the past as the previously explored issues of the usage of religion. However, understanding Norse paganism as a way of life certainly avoids the many pitfalls of religion. This understanding allows for the undogmatic, community-based, and highly varied nature of Norse paganism and does not carry the potentially distorting preconceptions bound up with the modern conception of religion. Furthermore, an understanding of paganism as a way of life allows for the plurality of experience required when approaching such an unorganized and varied entity. Indeed, can we say that the experience of a simple freeman maintaining a farm in the fertile valleys of Sweden was the same as a sorceress or vulva from Kalpang in Norway? The freeman may have had the matter-of-fact approach to paganism, where ensuring a good harvest was just as reliant on sacrificing to Freyr as ploughing the soil. On the other hand, the vulva, as possibly a prominent cultic leader of a community, believed fervently in the sorcerer's powers of Odin and his sacrifices for knowledge and power. Understanding paganism as a way of life is sufficiently flexible as to encompass both of these highly different experiences. Using religion, on the other hand, might lead to a more uniform understanding of paganism that ignores this historical complexity. But religion is not necessarily incorrect as a means of understanding Norse paganism. The Abrahamic understanding of it is certainly the root of many of the issues I have previously explored, but other understandings of religion certainly exist. For example, many would consider Hinduism to be one of the major religions of the world. It, notably, however, holds a similar matter-of-fact attitude to worship and practice as in Norse paganism, where one worships and sacrifices simply because it accords with dharma. That is, one engages in religious practice not because it is the truth, but rather because it is the way of things or necessary to life. Additionally, Hinduism does not bear anywhere near the same levels of dogmatism exhibited by the Abrahamic faiths and is still described as a religion. Furthermore, even the Abrahamic religions and their followers have a multitude of different experiences and conceptions surrounding worship and belief. Many Christians, for example, go to church every Sunday and would describe themselves as Christian despite not possibly even having large amounts of personal faith or adhering stringently to Christian dogma or the concepts associated with it. Rather, they carry out these activities because it is the cultural norms in which they were raised. It is, to them, the way of things, not some deeply felt existential truth or a comment on a true morality or dogma. This is certainly a follow of Christianity still, and no one would consider describing Christianity as a way of life rather than religion because of this. Additionally, describing Norse paganism as a way of life may move our focus away from the potentially deeply held faith by its followers, which a description of religion would certainly bring to mind. Also, a way of life understanding has the potential to ignore the importance of heightened states of being or concepts of the sacred, which we can certainly say would have been an element of Norse paganism. The public ritual of sacrifice, for example, would have been an intense feeling that overwhelmed the senses 
and would certainly evoke heightened states of emotion and feeling amongst the observers. Religion has these concepts of the sacred and heightened emotion already bound up within it as a concept. A way of life understanding, on the other hand, has the potential to create an unnecessarily sanitized or materialistic model of Norse paganism in which these concepts were not a factor. As we can see, this is a complex topic with no easy answers. Since we in reality know so little about Norse paganism, it is almost impossible to say with any confidence that we understand such a distant past. I wouldn't say, therefore, that we can definitely say that understanding paganism as a religion or as a way of life are more correct than one another. We simply do not know enough about these practices to confidently say which of these is more correct, and both have their strengths and weaknesses. Personally, I lean more towards understanding paganism as a way of life, but I still think that a definition of religion is valid and discussion is needed. What do you think? Is Norse paganism a religion or a way of life? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching this discussion. This is the first in a series of videos on Norse paganism where I will explore other parts of this fascinating piece of history. If you are interested in learning any more, make sure to watch out for future videos from Rin Koffer Productions.